Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, here, uh, welcome to the second of the uh, of the Hartford Responds, and to, and this evening we have the um, fabulous, youthful Dr. Steve New, uh, who's been a fellow of Hartford College at next Monday for twenty four years. Um, and when you chair governing body, as I did yesterday, and you run your eyes down the fellows list, um, Steve's name is fourth in the top now. He's been at Hartford. Um, for so long, but it's been a great. <laughs> that makes it. That makes it sound. Um, that 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 makes him sound kind of perhaps. Um, uh, uh, as you're about to discover, one thing that do, that Dr. Steve knew is not is dull. Um, he's actually one of the wittiest um, professors in the business school, and his his chosen area of research is on supply chains, um, and he's done he's done work with a number of multinationals. Um, he's actually been un, un, unpicked. Um, supply chains, particularly uh, those in Japan. Um, and this is the second of our kind of Hartford response in which we've asked um, particular fellows from particular disciplines to give their, their take on the impact of COVID uh, on the world that they study. Um, it was uh, Professor Shui only two weeks ago and he um, and, and discussed uh, his, his, his testing, uh, his prototype for testing um, the disease. This is, this is a different dimension tonight. Tonight we're going to be discussing the economics of it and how it's transforming the way potentially in which multinationals are kind of setting about their business. So with no more ado, I'm going to hand over um, the show um, to Steve and uh, he'll share his screen and take you through his slides and I'm looking forward to it. Steve, over to you. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, welcome everybody. I, I just had a quick look at the list of some of the people who've registered and it's lovely to see so many of you. I can't see you on the screen, uh, but um, uh, it's very nice of you to join us this evening. I hope we can have an uh, interesting discussion. I've got a lot of things to talk about. I'm going to try and whip through at pace to cover some material and there'll be plenty of time for discussion and questions uh, later on. So let me just uh, fill with the machinery a moment to share my screen with you. Um, and uh, uh, unless um, uh, Sarah or Will interrupt me, I'm assuming that's working. And what I'm going to do is just rattle through my uh, presentation to start with. So uh, these are interesting times. Of course, uh, everyone's suddenly an, a supply chain expert, uh, largely because of um, the, uh, uh, their experience over the last few months, uh, not least of which buying toilet paper earlier on uh, in this whole process. And it's been a, um, a, a time of great debate in the newspapers and amongst politicians about what the implications of the pandemic are going to be for the economy and for global supply chains in particular. So what I'm gonna try and do now is take people through some basic ideas. So um, those of you who've um, uh, seen me talk before on this sort of subject will recognize some old favorites, but we'll, we'll get back to uh, talking about the uh, current situation. Uh, and I hope we can have a, a good discussion about some of the challenges we're going to raise. Um, uh, clearly, what we're in in terms of the pandemic is one of the most extraordinary periods of all of our lives. And uh, it's difficult to kind of scale what's going on with previous things. Uh, certainly, it's not like any other previous pandemic. And it certainly, it's probably not like any other recent economic crisis. In fact, it's pretty clear now that even the 2008 financial crisis, 2008-9, which I figured would be the major defining business event of my lifetime a few years ago, uh, it's going to swamp that in terms of its uh, impact. So we're look, talking about something which might, uh, particularly if it goes on for a long time, uh, have a scale of impact of a major war. Maybe the Second World War is the kind of benchmark uh, of the scale of the impact, which is pretty scary and pretty uh, interesting. Now, what's interesting is all the press coverage about this. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion of um, what's going on in supply chains. This is from, I think, yesterday's FT. Uh, there's a thing called Project Defend, which uh, I don't sure is really a project at the moment. I think it might be a press release rather than an actual project, but it's an idea of thinking about the United Kingdom's uh, resilience uh, in terms of its supply chains and its reliance on other things in the world. And uh, there's uh, a lot of echoes, of course, with this discussion about what's going to happen with the consequences of COVID with what's the consequences of Brexit, which is also, of course, happening 
uh, going to be happening simultaneously very shortly. So let's just think about some of these headlines. Um, will coronavirus pandemic finally kill off global supply chains? to the Financial Times. Uh, companies should shift from just in time to just in case. Food security, are we cutting food too fine with our just in time supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. You've got the idea that there's uh, a lot of belief that the existing system is broken and we need to uh, rethink it. And that's what I'm going to do now. So I've got a kind of little agenda, which is really for my benefit more than yours, which is the, uh, so I can keep track of things. I'm gonna think a bit about why the words we're using for this debate matter, why the ideas matter, what are the fundamental things we're thinking about. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit about why supply chain resilience is not about holding more inventory and nor is it about reshoring activity. Uh, so these are the two things which seem to crop up uh, most in the extensive press coverage of these things. I'm not going to, I'm going to address why I think those things are red herrings. And I will say a little bit about what I think the actual impact of the crisis on supply chains is and uh, why that is connected with other recent events, uh, recent events, for example, in Bristol at the weekend. So we'll, uh, that's the general journey I want us to take on. So we're going to start off thinking about these words. And uh, the problem with the words that people are using in this debate is that nobody really wants to really define what they're talking about. Now, Journalists now, of course, I have a great respect for journalists, Will, uh, tremendous respect for journalists, but journalists do sometimes cross that line uh, between um, sort of hand wavy use of words and ideas. Um, and, and sometimes the discussion gets corrupted a bit by that. So the problem is, is these phrases, just in time and supply chain, are used very widely to mean lots and lots of different things. So we're going to uh, spend some time just uh, the beginning of the session, just making sure we're on the same page to discuss what that might be. So when people talk about supply chain, they might be talking about several different things. And the problem is often people are talking about several different things simultaneously. They could be talking about a physical pipeline of goods. They could be talking about a commercial web of interconnection between companies. They could think about management functions within a firm, or they can think about a, a cluster of firms in a region or an industry, like for example, the, uh, the West Midlands automotive cluster supply chain, as, uh, as if that was a thing. So uh, there's lots of different meanings and these meanings get sort of overlapping and uh, bounce around. And some people use an example of one thing to make a point about another. And so there's a bit of confusion. Here, I'm gonna forget the last two of these uh, completely. I'm not gonna discuss those at all. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do is um, just concentrate on uh, these two. In fact, I'm mostly to start with just going to focus on the physical pipeline. I'll come back to the commercial web uh, version of supply chains in a moment and just think about uh, three different ways of thinking about this physical pipeline. There's method in this because it'll enable us to unpick some of the uh, issues we're talking about in relation to COVID, not least of which because there's two different things that get called just in time and they're not the same. So understanding the differences between these uh, approaches is, is pretty important. So here we are, let's think about the traditional one to start with. So I imagine I was a grower, I'm gonna just use an example of oh, oh, pit leaks, the vegetable, and there's a consumer and we need to have some mechanism of getting it from the grower to the consumer. And so how we're gonna do that is have some sequence of physical steps that the uh, product goes through. So we go through the process of the wholesale and so forth. Uh, so that's a typical kind of really pretty rubbish uh, description of a supply chain that you get in all the textbooks. And that doesn't really tell you very much, but it tells you something about uh, uh, how the system works. Um, what's going to happen, of course, is there's going to be some uncertainty about how much, uh, how many leaks you're going to sell to the customers. And uh, that has to be taken into account by the retailer. And uh, what they're going to do is make orders back down the chain and a sequence of information gets passed back down the chain. And then that's followed by the supply of the vegetables going in the other direction. And of course, the complicating thing here is time um, because you, you, you can't do it. You know, someone buys a leak and then someone buys, makes an order and then an order goes back and an order goes back because then you wouldn't, uh, the replenishment time would be so slow, you'd run out of leaks. So in that case, we'll have to hold inventory. So there has to be inventory scattered across the supply chain. And for that purpose, um, uh, that's, uh, people are gonna have to hold inventory to accommodate the fact that they don't know what the other parties are gonna do next. 
And so that's the issue about the inventory in the system. It largely exists because there are uncertainty. Think about the wholesaler here. The wholesaler sitting in the middle of the supply chain and has got uncertainty coming at them from their customer. They don't know how much the customer is going to buy and they don't know how much the supplier is going to supply or deliver on time. So they've got to hold inventory and they'll be holding quite a lot of inventory. The more uncertain to, uh, those things are. And so uh, because you're holding all this inventory, what's going to happen is it's going to be very, very, very expensive. So the whole process of holding this uh, process of uh, people guessing what's going to come next in the sequence of events is going to mean there's going to be lots of inventory and that's really, really expensive. So holding inventory in a supply chain, even if something dull like leaks, is extremely expensive and that's because uh, the cost of capital, the cost of managing the inventory, uh, packaging it and uh, insuring it and all that sort of stuff, and the cost of it uh, um, going off or becoming obsolete. Uh, there's also actually another cost to inventory and this is where the discussion is going to get a bit interesting because there's another cost, a mystery cost, which, which I'm going to identify here that the inventory holds and the point of uh, uh, the just-in-time system is, uh, or one version of the just-in-time system is to think about this mystery cost. So while I'm talking you might want to spend some time thinking about what that mystery cost might be. Uh, and in some cases, for certain industries, you can make a fair guess that that extra cost is worth, uh, is much bigger than all the other costs involved. Okay, so now we think about how the supply chain works. This is the traditional kind of way. And uh, let's think about a coordinated just in time sort of system now. We're going to get rid of the wholesaler. We're not going to need uh, that person will disintermediate the wholesaler. And we'll just go straight from the retailer to the processor. And what we're going to do is link up the retailer and the processor with their integrated information system, which means that the processor can get access to the sales data one way or another of the retailer. It means that rather than having to guess what the retailer is going to want, the processor can actually see what the uh, retailer is selling. And uh, so you're taking out a bit of guesswork in the process, reducing the amount of inventory that needs to be held. And uh, uh, across these supply chains, we're going to use some integrated information systems. And we're also going to use um, contractual devices, call off contracts, which means that a grower has certainty about what they're going to sell. They don't have to um, grow stuff and then hope they're going to sell it to somebody. They can grow stuff in the knowledge that they've already pre-sold it. And the delivery process is just calling off uh, deliveries against something they've already sold. So it's another mechanism for reducing uh, the uncertainty in the system. And therefore, reducing the inventory that has to be held. So that reduces the inventory enormously. The retailers still got quite a lot of inventory at the end now because they've got to cope with the uncertainty of the customers. So the way they're going to do that is they're going to um, uh, uh, become very big because if they can uh, have a huge uh, customer base, then it becomes very easy or much, much easier to manage the uncertainties of what you're going to sell and what you're not going to sell. And that explains in part why supermarkets are so huge. And that explains why in our economy, we often find supply chains ending up being dominated by a major, major corporation, the, the thousand pound gorilla in the chain that controls the show. And that's an important issue which we're gonna come back to because that power is the perhaps the most significant thing we need to think about in terms of the COVID crisis, which we're gonna come back to shortly. So, um, the other thing that that power does is mean that the retailer can now extend their control over the supply chain by dominating the commercial terms and the operational processes uh, by making sure they call the shots in how the supply chain operates. So uh, actually the independent, commercial independence of the processes gets kind of washed away in this power grab from the powerful retailers, the like Tesco's and the Sainsbury's and the Walmart's who are controlling the supply chain as it goes back. So that's one version of a just-in-time supply chain. What it is, is we've speeded up the process, we're holding less inventory in the system, and it's to do with uh, that type of control. But that's not the only type of uh, just-in-time supply chain, because we also ought to look at this other version, which is the close-coupled one, which is something we'd associate with the automotive industry rather than the food industry. Um, so here, let's think about a car company and a tier of suppliers. And um, here we've got the integrated information system we saw before, we've got the call off contract uh, approach, uh, but when we've also got all that commercial and operational control going on as well. 
but um, increasingly, and uh, well, almost universally now amongst mass car companies, you've also got another very important element of just-in-time, which isn't particularly present in the other sorts of just-in-time, but is present here. And, and that's a very paradoxical thing. It's something that's counterintuitive. And for those people who are saying the just-in-time model is bust, mostly it's something that, that's, uh, that's been neglected in that uh, analysis. And that's this. And it's counterintuitive. And if you've not come across it before, it, it doesn't quite make sense the first time you go at it. So you may take a couple of runs to make any sense of this. And it's, it goes like this. What happens when things go wrong in the supply chain? And the uh, extraordinary invention that the Toyota Motor Company uh, invented in the 1970s uh, and onwards was a process that said, if something goes wrong, you stop. You stop the whole chain as much as you can. In fact, here, the, the interesting thing is the low inventory isn't just low inventory because it's cheaper to hold low inventory. Uh, it, it's low inventory because the low inventory is the mechanism by which you closely couple all of the stages in the production stage, which means a slight problem somewhere is going to turn into a crisis for the whole chain. It seems nuts. It seems completely counterintuitive that you would design a system that's deliberately fragile in this way. And that's the um, uh, uh, very strange uh, approach that uh, we've got here. So it's a strange uh, issue to make a system deliberately so it's going to trip up all the time. And that's because of this mystery extra cost I mentioned earlier on. So low inventory is used not just because of the inter immediate cost savings, because it closely cooperates, uh, uh, couples the system together, making it deliberately fragile. And what that means is that uh, problems cannot hide. It means if there's a problem in the supply chain, if you've got an unreliable supplier, if you've got problems in the factory, it means you can't build up buffers which then hide your problem. It means you have to face up to the problem and solve it straight away. You can't get by by burning off some inventory um, and uh, putting a band-aid over a problem. You have to bring the problem to the surface. And so the mystery cost that inventory gives you is the cost of hiding problems. Now, the point is, is that this, counterintuitive although it is, the financial impact of this issue for Toyota, for example, and all the companies who now copy Toyota, is that this is an incredible advantage to the just-in-time system. It probably dominates all the other advantages of the just-in-time system because it means that problems in the chain can be surfaced quickly, operational problems in that way. And it's exactly akin to what goes on within a factory of the, um, uh, the, the Toyota approach of pulling the Andon cord to stop the line. It's the same approach. So the reason you have small amounts of inventory in that sort of just-in-time system is because that's how you get this effect. That's how you get this thing. And it's called the first Toyota paradox because, well, it's paradoxical because you'd think uh, this would make the system very inefficient and uh, keeping on tripping over all the time would be a bad thing. But because it's combined with the process of problem solving and removing the problems, it has this uh, effect. There is a second Toyota paradox, but that's another talk. I have to come back and do that another time. Perhaps. So, uh, supply chain resilience is not about holding more inventory and it's not about reshoring. Let me, uh, I'm going to stop my uh, 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 screen share for a moment and, uh, and just uh, chat to you. Um, so let me just, uh, just talk to you a second. Um, now, the, uh, in all this discussion at the moment saying that this, this model, the just-in-time model is run, what's happened is that people are saying, um, uh, is they're rolling together lots of things they don't like about supply chains and talking them about it as if it was the just-in-time elements was the things that were the problem. In fact, there's plenty of problems in supply chains that need to be changed, but it's not the just-in-time bit that's the problem, it's other things. So uh, now if you think about the pandemic crisis, when things kind of kicked off in January and February, the first thing that Western industry noticed was that Wuhan factories were closing. And so there was going to be a problem about the uh, goods coming from Wuhan factories to the West. And this immediately started a discourse which said, we're too reliant on these just-in-time supply chains because this stuff, a bad thing is going to happen and we won't get the stuff we need. Now, really, if you look into the kind of psychodynamics of what's going on in that discourse, 
it wasn't really about goods not arriving on time. Um, we'll explore why that is in a second, but, but it's really about something else. And it's because when these kind of events happen, a very similar thing happened when, the, when there was the 2011 um, Tohoku uh, earthquake in Japan and uh, other events that have happened um, in the past. What happens is there's um, people use people use their fear of China uh, uh, as a way of uh, wrapping together lots of ideas uh, that make them uncomfortable. No one likes to be kind of reminded in the West that actually we've got ourselves into a situation where we cannot live in the material splendor in which we uh, operate um, w without China. We are entirely dependent on China um, because of all the stuff that we buy uh, from them. And of course that has a that's a difficult thing for some people to square up to um, when we think about the decline of um, Western manufacturing um, or in terms of certainly in terms of employment and we think about all the, uh, uh, the, the derelict factories in around Pittsburgh or in Barnsley or in Blackburn and we think about what's been lost in terms of manufacturing capability it's awkward to be reminded of this China dependency and, uh, and so whenever there's anything to do with supply chains in China flares up, there is this discussion, or, or we don't like thinking about that, perhaps we need to address that. Um, some of that thinking is logical, some of it, frankly, is just xenophobic and uh, uh, rather parochial, but, but anyway, never mind, that's, that's what people do. Now, the funny thing is, of course, is although uh, in February, everyone was talking about the shortages that were going to cripple Western industry, because of the Chinese factories closing down, it turned out the virus traveled faster than the parts. So whereas the parts were mostly coming by sea, the virus decided to travel by air. So um, by the time the shortages would have hit Western factories anyway, the Western factories were themselves closing down. And uh, so uh, in fact, in, in, I mean, almost with a strange irony, for the car companies in the UK, for example, dependent on parts coming from China, the problem has been with uh, the COVID crisis, not so much shortages of parts as a surplus of parts. In fact, all the parts that were still on the sea coming uh, from China uh, and the Far East into the UK, when the UK factories, uh, like the BMW factory here in Oxford, have just reopened today, uh, when that factory closed down, they have nowhere to put the parts. In fact, in uh, uh, Nissan in the Northeast had to uh, um, uh, rent out large amounts of warehouse space to store the part, the surplus parts they had from China because, because they couldn't use them. They'd, these factories are designed to be run in this close coupled way. There's no place to store this stuff. Um, so in fact, it works in a slightly different way. So that's an that's a interesting kind of uh, issue. It's uh, that's the when we're thinking about what's going wrong with the COVID crisis, we're thinking about um, shortages, but actually shortages might not be the thing, there might be some other issues we need to think about. Now I'm going to start staring my screen again in a second. Um, so, um, now this is a nice uh, uh, visualization of the difference between a system that's robust and resilient. And the work that has been done on supply chain resiliency in the last few years has really focused on the fact that actually it's pointless to talk about robust supply chains because problems will happen and things may happen with different geographical spreads. Uh, if you have one factory that burns down, that's one kind of problem and you might have to find ways of tackling that issue. And that, for example, you might be able to get around by having two suppliers rather than one for a, an item. But if you have something like an earthquake, which takes out a whole area, or you have something like COVID, which is a global catastrophe, so everyone is affected. It's not having a system that can keep going without stopping. It's a system that when it stops, it can be started again quickly. So it's how quickly it springs back. So you want a resilient system that springs back um, after a delay rather than one that isn't affected at all. And that's why just-in-time systems might actually be more resilient than the uh, um, uh, alternatives. So let's just uh, um, follow that idea through a second. Um, uh, uh, one of the iconic stories in, uh, in our field is this story of one of Toyota's suppliers in, the, uh, uh, in 1997 
that burned down. And rarely for Toyota, this was a single source supplier. It made a thing called uh, P valves there. And uh, what happened was the factory burnt down and everyone said, aha, you see, this just-in-time model doesn't work because there's no inventory. So the fact, you know, all of Toyota's lines essentially stopped that day. So uh, that being the case, um, you know, what happened next? Well, it turned out because uh, Toyota works very closely with its supply base and builds in capability and flexibility and agility into the operations of its suppliers, its suppliers were able to rally round and in a non-contractual way without anyone kind of keeping cost of what was going on, collaborate together very dynamically. And uh, the sequence of events is within a handful of days, the production line was back up again. Um, somebody else had learned how to make these very complicated parts very, very quickly by sharing ideas, sharing resources, helping one another out. And within about 10 days, production was back to normal volumes. So it was everyone in everyone's interest to make this work because they were part of that kind of uh, community. Now, uh, if you think about that, that's what makes you resilient, it's being adaptive and flexible. Stockpiling, having piles of inventory in your system does not make you resilient. It's only ever good for temporary problems because very soon you'll burn off whatever stock you have in that system. So um, it doesn't work for... Uh, for long lasting or permanent crises. So in the COVID crisis, with some exceptions, so I, I think PPE is perhaps something you'll talk about in Q&A perhaps, PPE is a separate kind of issue. Um, there are cases where you want stockpiles of things you need for particular emergencies like uh, uh, radiation protection suits if you've got a nuclear power station that might uh, melt down. But uh, if you, uh, for other sorts of long run problems, stockpiling just postpones the fateful day for, a, uh, for a, a few days, it doesn't actually solve the problem. Uh, it can be very, very expensive and uh, the, uh, you may get arguments about when it's sensible to use a stockpile or not. So that's of course exactly what happened in the United States with the federal stockpile of PPE, uh, which then it turned out of the, I think, some of the 30 million items of uh, 30 million masks, 5 million that were out of date anyway. So stockpiling is not the kind of resilience you want. You want adaptivity, uh, adaptiveness and uh, um, responsiveness from the system. Now, uh, uh, I should say, um, uh, I've spent a long time studying Toyota and to as will explain the, the Toyota supply chain. For years, I was very upset by the poor quality of the supply chain diagrams we had, uh, you know, the symbolic ones that we were looking at just a moment ago. And uh, our work tried to say, well, what does it look like? And when eventually we got the data to look at these things, we found these are actually not very informative because uh, there's so much data that having a map of the supply chain doesn't tell you very much. But, the, uh, but what we did kind of work out, interestingly, from looking at the Toyota system was that um, it turns out not to be, as we thought, kind of triangular, uh, like a pyramid, uh, but actually it was more barrel shaped. In fact, we coincidentally, entirely coincidentally, uh, coined the idea of it being a barrel shaped structure uh, rather than being a, a pyramid at exactly the same time that Toyota did just after the earthquake in 2011. And uh, so if one visualization of what we're thinking about with the Toyota system here is that there's this dependency on a small number of tier three suppliers, a surprisingly small number, who themselves supply many, many of the tier two uh, suppliers. Now, if you want to um, have a resilient and robust supply chain, what you need to do is to know who your suppliers are and to make sure that you're fully aware of who they are and that you can work with them to make sure they can respond to crises. And the consequence of the 2011 uh, tsunami and, and earthquake in Japan was that for, uh, car companies around the world have focused on mapping their supply chains and trying to understand those crucial dependencies and then uh, the amelioration process is relatively straightforward you just simply make sure that for each type of thing you're buying you've got another supplier in the wing somewhere who can uh, help you with that right so that's uh, um, uh, a thing I should just talk about the structure of supply chain for a moment we're, we're going to get on to what's going on with COVID in a second but just before we do the um, uh, go, go back to this leak supply chain I mentioned this, this one is a bit too simple, really. This, this diagram doesn't really say, say too much. Of course, if we were being 
consistent, what we would find is that actually there's a large number of um, companies involved here. So in fact, I've, this is massively simplified because there are dozens and dozens of companies involved in even the most simple uh, of supply chains. And that's because these simple boxes like grower or processor covers a multitude of different things. So for example, the grower, you might have the landowner, the tenant farmer, the actual picking of the crops won't be done by people who work for the farmer directly. They'll be done by uh, contract seasonal labor operated by a gang master. There'll be lots of different um, uh, logistics providers in, uh, involved. Um, many of those will use contract labor and uh, the distribution centers that are run by the retailer will probably actually be run on their behalf by um, contractors, by subcontract uh, logistics companies. So um, this is a type of complexity in even simple supply chains, which means we're not just thinking about complexity in the physical flow, but in the commercial flow as well. And we'll come back to why that's significant in a moment. In, in uh, one of my uh, good friends, uh, at Aston University today, I was talking to him um, online and uh, we were talking about a Starbucks cup of coffee um, and a report in The Economist uh, recently that uh, did some analysis that uh, suggested that if, to get you your cup of coffee, you've got at least, uh, I think it's 29 separate companies from th uh, 18 different countries are involved in the provision of a cup of coffee from Starbucks. So this is um, uh, a great deal of complexity we need to take into account. Right, now, why are these supply chains so complicated? It's because things are complicated. And this is gonna get us onto the question about reshoring now. So the other part of the public discourse about COVID is that people realizing the fragility of, uh, and the uh, problems associated with these supply chains will want to bring everything back home and they'll bring back the uh, supply chain to uh, the UK or the United States or wherever you're working from. And this is implausible. And that is because uh, the stuff that we use is so complicated and it relies on so much stuff from anywhere. Nothing comes from anywhere. Everything comes from everywhere. There are no British goods, uh, pretty much. And there's no American or German goods either, pretty much. Either. In fact, the only place in the world where they, you could say there is that country's good pretty much is China nowadays because of its scale. Uh, everywhere, what we're dependent on is phenomenal complexity of uh, the products we use and the supply chains which generate them are acts of extraordinary uh, complexity. When we think about uh, you know, who makes an iPhone, this isn't like, is an old example of a, a Nokia phone, but um, when someone makes a smartphone, uh, we tend to think of, well, who made it? Well, that would be one of, you know, where it was assembled. But actually the assembly is a tiny fraction of, of the complexity of a phone. It's not, that's not where the phone is made. The phone is all the parts that go into it and that is, they are made everywhere. So we have no hope of uh, having indigenous industry. Now we could say, could we bring back selected bits of this for, for a particular purpose? And that gets us to the question of capability. What, what can we get back? And that's one of the things, uh, the, the common wisdom is that the location of manufacturing around the world is only driven by cost. And that is largely uh, true up to a point, but it will also uh, be dependent now on capability because the things we're asking people to do are very complicated. The reason why manufacturing is in China is because the Chinese are very good at manufacturing. And that's, that's not going to change. And to bring back the capability to do that in the UK is not just the question of the fact that UK workers are, um, are more expensive, it's to do with the fact that we don't have the capability, we don't have the companies, and we don't have the expertise to do that. So the idea that we can use COVID as a prompt to reshore is, um, uh, so this is a, a, a myth. This is a great example of a, German supermarket a couple of years ago in Hamburg, who as part of our anti-racism uh, campaign, uh, decided to remove all the products on their shelves that didn't come from Germany to demonstrate to their customers just how interconnected the German economy is for basic foodstuffs with uh, other countries. 
And this would be the same anywhere in the world when you, when you do this exercise. That everything is fantastically interconnected and we have this um, uh, interconnection between one another. So we, we stand and fall together uh, in terms of international supply chains. Now, let's just move on to COVID. Now, this is a McKinsey uh, graph and uh, which uh, describes the different problems that organizations are facing because of COVID in supply chains. And so we've got material shortages, we've got drops in demand, worker shortages, cash flow, and these might affect different industries in different ways. One thing we know is that some industries are being completely hammered. And the one industry which may be devastated beyond repair is aerospace and aviation, which I'll come on to in a moment. This is uh, some ILO analysis. Um, manufacturing very high, but transport medium high. I think that's uh, uh, an underestimate because aviation is the one industry where I suspect the impacts of COVID will be very great. Let's look at some data, again, taken from a recent uh, McKinsey report. This is a this particular slide is about Germany. And uh, uh, we're looking at uh, an absolutely devastating drop in the uh, flying. And that has had knock-on consequences very quickly to the airlines and then to the aerospace production industries, companies like Rolls-Royce and Boeing and um, uh, Airbuses. Um, uh, productivity activity has dropped within uh, within a few weeks. It dropped forty percent. So this is phenomenal uh, impact on that industry. And what we're doing right now on Zoom might be the disruptive technology that actually has a very long impact, uh, long run impact on, on that industry. Um, interesting. This is some uh, uh, PwC uh, survey data about how people are changing their supply chain strategies in response to COVID, and uh, where I'm going to get to in a minute, let's look at the third bar down here, talking about changing contractual terms. And that's really where I'd like to take our discussion and, and, and close in a few moments time, is uh, one of the responses, the real impact of uh, COVID on global supply chains has been the concentration of power and the distribution of pain. Because one of the interesting things about global supply chains, and I mentioned about the way the retailers use scale to control the, uh, to call the shots in the supply chain, is the interesting story about the COVID crisis is who is suffering, who, how is the pain being distributed, and it is not being distributed fairly. Um, uh, I'm going to skip this slide and come back to it later on maybe, and here we are. So let's think about some of the things that are going on at the moment. What we're finding is that uh, workers who are vulnerable, were vulnerable before the COVID crisis, have become exceptionally vulnerable during the COVID crisis. So there are dozens and dozens of stories now of people uh, and sectors where, uh, where employees are being uh, discriminated against, where their rights are being challenged, where their opportunities to join unions are being threatened, because the crisis is providing the mechanism, uh, the opportunity for um, organizations to uh, behave in an exploitative way towards their workforces. And this is being played out between companies and their suppliers. So the question of who gets paid, who carries the can, who, when a force majeure is invoked to revoke a contract, uh, who picks up the tab for that, that is the real issue about supply chains under COVID. It's bringing the injustices and the, um, uh, problems we have about equity and uh, decency in the world really into sharp focus. One of the major human rights charities has been working assiduously to try to squeeze out from closing companies what, they, what are they doing about their suppliers, particularly in Bangladesh. And it looks like there is going to be an absolute uh, devastating period for the people who work in Bangladesh and the, uh, the millions of people who work in the Bangladeshi uh, textile industry as Western companies uh, turn away from any sense of obligation to each other. So this level of complexity and interconnection we have with the global supply chains, those supply chains which give us all of our material wealth uh, at the most astonishing efficiency, this incredibly extended machine which exists to provide us with wealth, physical wealth unknown to humankind ever before. Uh, that comes with a set of obligations that we all have. And that's the challenge that we've got to think through about our involvement 
in supply chains and what the COVID pandemic is really going to be all about. I've had leaks earlier on. When I first started getting interested in extremely exploitative conditions in labor uh, supply chains, I thought I'd have to end up doing lots of exotic trips to corners of the world. In fact, I ended up going to Cambridgeshire and uh, having a research interview with the Cambridgeshire police about their um, uh, actions against modern slavery in the UK agricultural sector, you know, within a short drive of where I'm currently sat in, uh, in Woodstock, north of Oxford, I can drive to fields where the workers would be Lithuanian contract workers working under conditions of extraordinary uh, oppression. But the, uh, the research interview I had with the Cambridgeshire Police is the only research interview in my academic career I've had where I've ended up crying during the course of the interview, when you understood the level of um, degrading behavior that was being directed towards the picking of leaks that were going into the supply chains for the co-op, Marks and Spencer, Tesco, Sainsbury's, et cetera, all the companies which we use routinely. So this is our challenge about COVID is to face up to uh, the way in which the crisis is shifting pain and shifting pain onto those least able to protect themselves. And that's why I think there's a kind of strange resonance with the events at the weekend when we were thinking about uh, the past heritage that we've had in exploitation. And now eventually several years, so a hundred of years later, coming to terms with what it was. I wonder how long it will take us to come to terms with uh, what's going on on our behalf in global supply chains. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there and, uh, and, and take some questions. Uh, thanks very much indeed. And thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you. Steve, fantastic. I mean, really, uh, I loved your two trees. I love the tree, the resilience and the robust tree. And uh, I think it was really, really intriguing. Um, set me thinking. Um, it also set me thinking that you really don't, I mean, you, 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 your point about everything comes from everywhere is also kind of... Um, um, dramatic, and your your critique of people who stockpile. Um, I was thinking of um, uh, some of the things on social media um, in the um, in the first weeks of the crisis, where there were pictures of kind of rooms full of toilet paper from individual consumers, and you kind of think, ten weeks later, they've probably still got rooms full of toilet paper, and how idiotic they must look. And I guess, <laughs> I, I, I think I think the stockpiling, the the companies that stockpile may be feeling the same way. However, I mean my my, and I also like your conclusion that actually, um, um, this pandemic may not be requiring us to rethink globalize, globalization in the sense of um, how we organise ourselves economically, but it's thrown up um, dramatic kind of lessons about inequality, and um, that's all to the good. But I just want to ask you a kind of a straight question. I mean, 60 um, emerging countries, the, the World Bank said uh, in its report two days ago, um, are going to have um, a decline in GDP for the first time since 1945. No, that hasn't happened. Um, you know, the developing world is really taking a big hit. And one of the reasons why it's taking a hit is actually because of, amongst other things, you know, the withdrawal of investment um, and the, the freezing of opportunities coming with people kind of being very wary about their supply chain. So I'm not sure that you really, I mean, you, 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 you placed a big question mark about whether the forces driving globalization are coming to a, an end. Um, um, but I mean, um, maybe things are more dramatic than you, than you, than you are kind of hypothesizing. I mean, are we going to carry on really with a world in which everything comes from everywhere? Um, I mean, the first round effects, you know, don't look as though they're proving your point. It looks as though there is some drawing in of horns and some reshoring and, and all the rest. Well, that, that's, that's very good. Uh, there, there are some limited elements of attempts to reshore, but um, uh, most of the studies which have looked at these things find that one, when there is, uh, you find one example of something reshoring, and then that's more than outweighed by more examples of stuff going in the other direction. So just empirically, uh, reshoring is not a thing. It's, uh, it's an idea, but it's not really any a, a substantial um, part of what's going on in the global economy. And of course, it, it, we could have 
a different sort so of. Are you saying? Are you saying that there's no reshoring, or are you saying that? Uh, I'm saying when you get reshoring, it's generally matched by stuff going in the other direction. So there's, uh, um, you know, stuff moves around all the time. Uh, there are some, you know, uh, particular examples in particular industries, and particularly where governments make particular efforts to make investments to bring back particular types of industry. But for the most part, uh, there isn't much reshoring going on. Um, there's a bit more nearshoring, and there's reshoring in the sense of. Um, uh, of, of stuff being moved from place to place. So, for example, there is right now a lot of people who are worried about the, not just so much COVID, but about geopolitics and thinking that the dependence just on China is uh, tricky and so they'll spread out to Vietnam and, uh, uh, and other places in the region or India or Turkey or Mozambique or Mexico. So things move around, but, um, but there's not a lot of things coming back and when they do come back when manufacturing when there are cases of manufacturing reshoring they don't bring jobs uh, because they come back in an automated fashion so the idea of sort of a Trumpian idea of getting Baltimore and uh, uh, um, Philadelphia back as being major power, uh, manufacturing centers is kind of, you know, for the birds um, but there is there's, there's some of that but we we could have a different economy where we, where not everything came from everywhere but it would require fundamental changes to our lifestyle because, because we're just used to having all the products and uh, all the stuff that we have. If we wanted to live simpler lives, that would be a possibility, but, but we, we would have to have that connection to it. So uh, straight question, um, is globalization under threat? In my word, no. I don't, think, I don't think the long run secular trend of, uh, of, of global interconnection is going to go away anywhere fast. Um, and uh, if, it, if it were to, of course, that would also be bad news for the developing world. Um, so there's plenty of bad sides to, to globalization, but it's also only through globalization that developing countries can develop export related industries. So, so um, I don't think globalization itself is going. What is absolutely clear though, uh, is that the geopolitics is all in the air and exactly how globalization works out over the next 10 or 20 years is going to be you know, different to what it has been previously. The, the WTO is on its knees. It's about, it's, it's, it's basically um, about to sort of stop functioning. Um, there's the uh, Trumpian assault on um, uh, relationships with China. Uh, there's China's own uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which is trying to uh, be a kind of a grabbing influence across large chunks of um, the developing world. So all of these currents will change how globalization works, but globalization is not going away. Okay. I mean, I'm, I mean, there's lots of questions coming up. I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll frame a couple of them and then hand over to Sarah, our chair. Sure. I mean, there's a, a number of questions that are saying, you know, to what extent are there differential effects in different kind of industries? And to what, extent, to what extent are there, um, is your thesis going to be challenged by the fact that different companies are coming out of this crisis at different speeds? So that, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's, this is not a, an homogenous story. I mean, you picked up, no, I, I mean, what about, what about healthcare as a supply chain? Is it different from others? Well, well, healthcare, there is, you know, there are reasons why you need to stockpile some healthcare things, you know, and that, you know, there's drugs for, the events of pandemics, for example, and, uh, and PPE and so forth are exactly the sort of things which are the exceptions to the rule about stockpiling. Um, but in general, in the healthcare uh, industry, um, uh, it's become more global and will increasingly become more global. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, but your, your point you make about the non-evenness is completely correct. So there's definitely going to be um, differential effects in terms of company, uh, countries as they progress and indeed uh, between industries. In fact, you know, um, different conversation to have, perhaps not one for here straight away, but the, um, there is now some evidence that the economic recovery of companies post COVID is very closely related to how strictly and how long they, sh they lock down for. So uh, those of us who are, those countries like ours, where we may be coming away from lockdown a little bit before we've really got control over the, of the virus, uh, that may have the biggest economic disadvantage to us. There's a question here which I find fascinating, and, I, and Sarah, you come in when, when, immediately you want to. Uh, 
but I mean, online sales have more than doubled during the crisis. Yeah. And they're, and they're going to stay high. What are the medium term implications for supply chains of this shift? Uh, well, th there's one massive societal implication is that society has got to do something about Amazon. Uh, because when we say stuff has shifted online, actually, that is code for, uh, well, in the UK, there's groceries, which is now kind of all online, but the um, uh, uh, effectively, but, uh, but when we talk about online shopping, I mean, right, really, this is code for Amazon in the West and then the equivalent companies in China. Uh, what we've got is the absolutely unprecedented concentration of power, and that's the problem for society. You know, this goes back to J.K. Galbraith and the idea of countervailing power in systems and things. What we we, we have is um, in uh, certainly in Amazon in terms of supply chains for normal domestic things that we buy that aren't food, um, uh, something that's creeping towards a kind of monopoly situation. And they are so brilliantly run. They are, they are so efficient. They do the game I described on my little chart of being uh, the kind of um, um, uh, uh, coordinated supply chain um, absolutely astonishingly well. And because they are so good at that, that's, that's dominating. So um, that has a huge effect. And it's very bad for society if concentration of power goes that far. Um, Sarah, do you want to come in and uh, and take over the chair? Chair, I mean, I'm very. Yeah. Happy. Can I let you do that? Why don't you, why don't you do that? Okay, uh, I'll put myself on mute and I'll stop my yeah. video. Okay. That's great. Thanks all. We've got a load of questions coming in, um, Steve, and thanks so much. That was such an interesting talk. Um, <laughs> I didn't know supply chains could be so interesting. Um, so uh, we'll just start at the beginning. Um, were you surprised about the way people went about stockpiling in response to COVID-19? And do you think that there's a lot to be said about those that did and those that didn't? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I separated out a discussion between companies and, um, uh, and people here. So think about people for the moment. Actually, I don't think there was much stockpiling. Uh, the evidence is, is that people just started buying a bit more. Uh, there were photographs on, you know, on Twitter of people with whole trolley loads of toilet paper and things, and you know, undoubtedly there was a bit of that. But, but mostly, um, of course, uh, I mean, I don't know how to say this delicately, but people were doing more of their pooing at home, and uh, and also pasta. You know, people were buying pasta not necessarily because they're stockpiling; it's just because uh, if you're not eating out of the house and every meal is inside, then pasta is very, you know, it's the one thing most people can cook, or children will eat. Uh, they certainly won't eat leeks. Uh, I don't know from experience. Anyway, but that's uh, but so the stockpiling is it was a thing, but it wasn't the major issue that was going on. The major issue was just there was a shift in the consumption pattern. Um, funnily enough, with toilet paper, uh, toilet paper supply chain actually had a glut before the COVID crisis because they uh, the, the toilet paper companies had uh, the people involved in the distribution chain for toilet paper had actually done their own stockpiling before Christmas with a view to if there was chaos for Brexit um, and uh, and they hadn't burned that off so in fact there was loads of supply it was, the reason the shelves were empty is just it was going off the shelves faster than they could get it on but it was never really a shortage of any sort uh, so you know people who stockpile well you know naughty them but you can kind of understand you know I don't feel a great sense of uh, moral superiority over them and I'm, I'm please don't look in my garage at the amount of pasta I have there but the um, but companies that stockpile, uh, sometimes it really does backfire uh, because it's one is this sort of inventory management is something where you get the instant and strong application of sod's law. That if you do stockpile, what it turns out is you end up with the wrong stuff in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so, stockpiling, uh, unless it's done very, very carefully, is, is you know, a, a difficult thing to pull off as a firm. Okay, almost sounded like you had a silver lining for Brexit there as well, which is uh, worrying. <laughs> well, um, not really. anyway. <laughs> so the next question, um, what impact will climate change have on global supply chains? Or to put it another way, what impact do global supply chains have on climate change? Oh, well, that's a brilliant question. And, uh, and that is, in fact, and in fact, with a slightly longer slot, I think I would have gone uh, to a discussion of exactly that. Because actually, the one th good thing you can say about the COVID crisis is it might give us an opportunity to a bit of dress rehearsal for the big crisis, which is climate change. So climate change is the, the dominant thing in, in uh, uh, that's going to affect the economy over the next 20 years. And, um, uh, and it's absolutely true that there's a lot of supply chain activity, which is uh, detrimental to the climate. And 
and as we change our behavior in response to the climate that will also change supply chains but there are some counterintuitive things here so for example um, um, uh, you probably find that if you are looking at some fruit that you're buying in Sainsbury's and uh, you're worrying about the carbon footprint of the you know, kiwi fruit that come from Kenya or something like that then the uh, um, then this stuff has been air freighted from Kenya so it's got a huge carbon cost and you think well maybe I shouldn't buy that well maybe you shouldn't but the impact of you eating that uh, kiwi fruit uh, the carbon load is probably much more to do with your trip in your family saloon car to the supermarket to pick up the kiwi fruits than it is the share of the air freight so in fact actually there are some you know, the global transportation is a big issue in terms of the environment but once it's spread out amongst all the stuff the other environmental impacts often um, uh, demonstrate it. so for example in, in lots of food categories not all but in lots of food categories food waste in the home is by far a bigger environmental disbenefit than the fact that it's come from the other side of the world that's really interesting <laughs> um okay and yeah i think you're so right that is something that <laughs> you could do a whole nother webinar series on so, so we, uh, we really could, yeah. perhaps that'll be the next one um so a question from gavin jones how might countries coming out of the crisis at different times impact the future supply chain Wow, yeah, that's another, another interesting thing. So what we kind of know is that some some countries are, are doing this better than others, and uh, and um, you know the extreme cases are South Korea and New Zealand, where they've managed to offensively control the virus, and that means they can resume lots of normal uh, economic activity very very quickly. Uh, it may be that we are carrying a heavy burden of some kind of semi lockdown for a very long period of time, because we haven't. You know, we've still got a very large number of people with new infections every day. It's going down, but it's, you know, it's going down very slowly. So, I mean, who knows exactly how that will play out. But my prediction would be that the economy, the, um, how the supply chain activities will, will be, will be a, a sort of sub-question of how the economies play out, and the economies will play out if they manage to get control of the situation quicker. So my, I wouldn't be hopeful for either the United States or the UK on that score. I'd be more hopeful for Germany, uh, for example. Okay. Um, what power does the consumer have to correct the inequalities in the global supply chain um, oh, oh, yeah. beyond boycotting particular brands? Yeah. No. Well, that's uh, that really is the uh, the nub of what my current research is about, which is about how do we, how can we society regulate companies and what they do? Um, companies have all the power. They do all the things. They exercise all the uh, um, discretion of how, of how things are organized but it's very difficult for states directly to regulate them it has to be some something going on with civil society and states involved and so I think there is something you know it's not that we can't do anything as consumers but the trouble with consumers is we don't have the visibility we don't have the information to be able to do very much but us as citizens as civil society we, we might have more to do so I think the first starting point is we have to become curious about where stuff comes from and what the conditions it's made. And we have to start holding companies accountable to that. that and that, you know, consumer boycotts might be a part of that, but, but more importantly, it's just asking the questions and, and asking to know and getting visibility. And um, there's a question here from John Clark, which is on a similar vein. Um, how can we as citizens, governments, advocates, etc., influence those decisions about pushing the burden of risk onto the shoulders of those more vulnerable post-COVID? Oh, wow, that's a brilliant question. Uh, John, I don't, I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, uh, I guess it's politics. Actually, it's just politics. Um, uh, and that's what this is. I think we have to have a politics which engages with companies. Um, the, uh, you know, on the left, in the UK and around the world, uh, the left has kind of abdicated its engagement with business. If it, to the extent that it engages with business, you get a kind of a group of people on the far left who kind of think all oh, business is bad. But we do need a new kind of political engagement with companies as political entities. There needs to be a, a politics of how we deal with companies, and that's the crucial thing. So it starts with the state regulating, but it also involves. Um, uh, other kind of uh, structures that might exist 
um, which may be not quite full regulation of companies, but the sort of regulations which give some space for civil society to act. So I'm currently very much in, interested in the Modern Slavery Act, which requires companies to do a little bit of revealing of what they do in their supply chains. But that only works if there's a matching activity of humans uh, in society who are engaging with the companies and sort of um, uh, listening to what they're saying and challenging them and engaging in some kind of debate. We're absent of that, the legislation doesn't work at all. So I think it's, there's a, an emergence of a need for companies, or for individuals, uh, citizens, to start engaging with companies in, in new ways. Mm. Um, a question here about globalization. Uh, do you think that globalization has benefited humanity? Uh, do you think on the whole it has been for the better? Yes. Yeah, that's a rather rude short answer, but yes, <laughs> and, 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 the, and the acid test for that is if you can imagine a world without globalisation, well, we wouldn't be having this conversation to start with. We wouldn't have the technology, and uh, and we wouldn't have the um, you know the wherewithal of the material well-being we, we've got. Um, that's not to say all of this is good, you know, and there are lots of bad things, but the uh, there isn't a version of the modern world. Which, which isn't globalized, that's conceivable, uh, I don't think. So um, yeah, I would say globalization is uh, unfettered globalization. And in particular, where huge corporations can avoid regulation by governments by being so big they can't be regulated. So they don't pay tax and that sort of thing is, that's a very bad thing. And so that, that is, that's unequivocally bad, but that's not the same as globalization overall. Mm, sort of working out the balance, I suppose. Yeah. Um, has Britain been adversely affected by COVID-19 and Brexit because of our reliance on trade and imports? Uh, yes, but, uh, but everyone's reliant on trade and imports. There aren't any company, countries that aren't. I mean, the only, one, the only country that is remotely not reliant on imports is China, and that's just because it's so humongously huge. Um, but uh, uh, because we're not going to ever be as big as China um, in terms of people or, or geography, uh, no, we're always going to be reliant on imports. And so we are necessarily uh, vulnerable. Now, there are, might be particular things which we would be better at. So, for example, um, the Brit Britain has a reasonably sophisticated pharmaceutical industry, which has been very successful. And so that's a good thing. But what we have seen is that industry is in the process of leaving uh, because of Brexit. So uh, we, uh, um, uh, we should be trying to retain capability within the company and, and develop, uh, within the country in developing that. Mm. Um, so another question from John Clark here. Um, the grower to consumer supply chain leading inevitably to huge supermarkets makes sense and is fascinating. But the pattern is much clearer in some countries, for example, the US and the UK than others, for example, France, Italy, India. Have you got any thoughts on why this is? Is it just that those countries are slower to shift towards the hypermarkets? Okay, I'm just reading the question again. To, um... Oh, sorry, it's in answer. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it just remind me of the question again. I didn't quite get the... Sorry. Um, uh, so the, gr uh, the grower to consumer supply chain leading inevitably to huge supermarkets makes sense. Oh, yeah. But the pattern is much clearer in some countries, for example, yeah. the US and UK than others, France, yeah. Italy, etc. Any thoughts on why? Is it just that those countries are slower to shift to the hypermarkets? Yeah, in fact, it, it probably, um, it, you think it's a very good question. So, for example, in Japan, retailing looks quite different than it does in the UK. And, uh, you know, shops are different, but also the corporate structures which sit behind it are different as well. So, um, uh, and in some parts of the world, cooperatives are a much bigger thing than they are in, in other places. So there are alternatives. Probably though, if you were to look at the secular trend across all countries, you know, over the last 30 years, everything does kind of creep towards um, something that looks a bit like the European US model. Um, uh, even in countries like Russia, actually, it, uh, there's um, a shift stepping forward in that uh, direction. Uh, and often actually because of the explicit involvement of companies like, um, uh, you know, who, uh, Walmart and people who operate in lots of different countries around the world. So there is a, probably a pattern going in that direction. There are alternatives and the co-op is a very good alternative uh, uh, model, which is, um, you know, that we could as a country be much more interested in exploring mutual ownership as a, a way of uh, running companies of that sort of scale. Okay. 
Um, so you touched a bit on uh, healthcare supply chains when you were speaking mm -hmm. with Will. Um, there's a question here from Robin Van Aken. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Steve. Really, oh, fascinating. <laughs> really fascinating to hear your points of view. Um, thanks very much for sharing. I'd love to hear any reflections that you might have from your work in the healthcare sector, i.e. how might hospitals look at inventory capacity supply chains in the future around items such as PPE and ventilators and what general lessons can the NHS learn from the crisis? Ah, okay. Well, that's probably... Um, Robin, I'm not sure I can answer that without switching on my consulting meter. So, uh, that, that, but uh, a vague answer to that question is going to be um, um, one there's been a massive amount of um, complexity in the last few months uh, about uh, uh, medical supply chains in the UK and that's largely been down to um, uh, um, the intrinsic problems we're facing which are very very difficult and also a series of rather chaotic judgments from the very top uh, at the government level um, and uh, decisions which have been made which are slightly, slightly curious. So for example, PPE, for example, you may have seen there's some very strange contracting decisions been made, giving companies who've got no experience of procuring PPE to you know, very large uh, contracts to, to do things. So there's been a, a mixture of stuff going on. Broadly speaking, uh, there's um, a, a tension to be managed in healthcare procurement because you need to operate at a high level and get economies of scale and coordination across big systems. Uh, in, in the US, it works differently, obviously, to here, but in here, the, it's the NHS is the issue. But you do have to have um, sufficient feedback from users on the ground into that process. And if there's been a flaw with NHS procurement more than any other flaw in the last 25 years, it's been that balancing the need for coherent centralization but getting the people to actually use the stuff involved in the procurement process as well that that balance has been difficult to manage um love to talk to you more about that robin give me a call sometime <laughs> um i'm very aware that will has to head off so um will i don't know if you wanted to just to sort of sign off now and then we can continue with a couple more questions um yes yeah, so um well look for, i mean i just wanted to say how um uh, yeah. It was a note of surprise, Sarah, in your um, voice with you about how surprisingly interesting global supply chains were, you know. Sorry, that sounds a bit rude, yeah. actually. <laughs> no, I, I figure it is, but it's an occupational hazard. Yeah. But I mean, the, it's fantastic. I mean, I think it was a, it's been a great, great, fantastic talk. I mean, I, and I, you know, and, and, you know, and Steve, as we might, as we expected, is very, you know, manages to combine, you know, um, a kind of certain mordant kind of scepticism about the world with with you know fantastic wit and it's just amazingly engaging so steve thank you very much that's very kind of you thank you well thank you for asking me and i hope we can do some of this again thank you <laughs> Um, what, what I'll say, um, Steve, is we've still got quite a lot of questions, so shall I suggest that people um, email them to you or email them to me and then uh, you can answer them that way? I think I've just been eyeballing some of the questions by <laughs> many people who I know and love dearly as well, so that's, uh, I'd love to uh, engage with that discussion, but maybe the way to do that so we don't lose these questions now is uh, if, if you can keep a can you record the questions? Can you capture them? Uh, I don't think that I can, no. But um, if <laughs> if you've submitted a question, um, if you want to just sort of copy it onto your own dashboards and st um, send it in an email to the development office, um, I can then forward them all on to Steve. And, and, and I would love to engage with all of those questions very, very much indeed. Yeah, very good. But let's not lose the question. We'll find a way of keeping uh, keeping yeah. that somehow. Yeah. Oh, just Brilliant. One one thing from me, I mean, if people want, I mean, it's, it's a complete um, subject change, but on Monday evening at 6.30, there's a Hartford conversation with Rory Bremner. And anyone on this on this call who who's a, wants to be amused and diverted, please join us, jo please join me for a similar format on 6.30 on Monday. Um, that's good fun. Great, thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you all very much for joining. And um, do email across those questions and, and we'll try and get them all answered. Okay. All right. <laughs> thank, yes, you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much.